In this era of climate change and declining biodiversity, seed banks play a crucial role in preserving botanical diversity, plant life, and through that effort, the human race itself. Spurred by the impending completion of this Svalbard Global Seed Vault in 2008, I initiated a photographic project called Archiving Eden. And I was inspired by the simultaneously pessimistic and optimistic aspects of this vault. On one hand, we have individuals and governments from all over the world who are collaborating together to create the first truly global botanical backup system. And on the other side, the gravity of climate change and political instability has created the need for an inaccessible vault near the North Pole. So there are 1,400 seed banks in the world, and they range from small private banks that save seeds from one se growing season to the next to massive governmental institutions that save seeds for 200 years or more. And this was the first photograph I made, and I was so surprised. It's a small regional bank in Texas outside of Austin, and I was so surprised to see volunteers working there and how much of the work was actually done by hand. Seed banks save seeds so that if there's a catastrophe, they can reintroduce a whole species. And um, rare plants are not collected, and desert plants are of particular interest now because of the predicted overall increase in global temperature. And this is the seed bank, uh, this is the, the U.S. National Seed Bank. This is the United States National, uh, National Center for Genetic Resources Preservation. And this one was, uh, compared to that regional seed bank in Austin, it was like walking into a James Bond film. <laughs> Photographs are, uh, are a trace of something that was recorded in the past. And when you look at them in the present, there's that tension between the past and the present that makes the passage of time an underpinning element of all photography. And tracking time while I'm in the seed banks is constantly on my mind, from the exposures I make, which take 15 minutes or more, to the collections themselves, which are collected in the past and are trying to preserve these materials for a future that's so distant that it can't even be known. And this um, machine tracks time through temperature and humidity cycles. And this is also, these are research seedlings at the National Center for Genetic Resources Preservation. And when I opened the door to this incubator room, it was amazing. There was these beautiful green plants that actually are living in this very sterile environment and this kind of heavenly white light that made it seem like a secret garden. And I thought, I really want to um, change the way that I'm photographing and add a second layer to this project and photograph and record in a more openly poetic way. So um, it, this led to a collaboration with scientists at two of the banks to use the on-site x-ray machines that they use for research purposes, but I wanted to, to somehow peer into this quest to you know, preserve the spark of life in these tiny vulnerable plantlets and seeds. Some are no larger than a grain of sand. Um, and these, uh, this is, uh, these kind of rather seductive plantlets are uh, corn seedlings. And so the, the scale of time that they're working with and also the size of these giant massive banks filled with tiny little pieces of life, that scale shift from the macro to the micro made me think about photographing uh, with the x-rays a way of speaking about that uh, span of time that can go from macro to micro. So this might be a tiny sea creature or a distant star, but in fact it's a, a, a seed head that I uh, collected in Texas. And the extraordinary visual power of x-rays that allow you to see what human vision cannot allowed me to peer into the actual uh, seed pods. And uh, you know, interestingly enough, this one for instance visually echoes the architecture of seed banks. And um, so it's kind of, it's got that magic connection. These libraries of life are literally teeming with diverse forms that are fertile and in a state of suspended animation. And I wanted to talk about the tension between this elusive goal of stopping time and the stopping time and living materials. So um, 
I made a, a certain type of print for some of them on these digital, digital collages that are, it's called a lenticular. And as you move by it, it changes. So it really speaks about the notion of uh, the, sten the tension between the stillness and change. And there's an interesting conversation going on in contemporary art right now that really challenges and questions the role of beauty. And that's certainly a concern I have uh, in the back of my mind as I'm working on this important project. These are cryogenic tanks at the National Center for Genetic Resources Preservation. And some seeds are uh, not, they don't develop well from, they don't reproduce well from uh, seeds. So that um, the plants that they use them from, ha they have to be reproduced as clones. And in seed banks, they store the clones in these tanks, which are filled with liquid nitrogen. And I always thought that clones would be exactly alike. And so I was surprised to see, for instance, with these strawberry clones, that like photography, which in theory, you could have multiple exactly the same prints from a single negative. In fact, the uh, derivatives usually have individual variations. And so as I was working with these digital collages, I wanted to talk about that potential endless recycling of genetic information. And so I digitally cloned the uh, walnut trees, tiny little walnut trees about this size, and sweet potatoes. And I, by cloning them digitally, I created, created this collage. Now, before cryogenic research, Clones were kept as field collections, and they still are. Um, there's extensive field collections of clones all over the world. But this is the Medici Palace, and this collection is 500 years old. And um, you can see that the trees, it's rare and diverse citrus that they collected. And um, the terracotta pots have to be moved inside during the winter because Florence is cold enough that they would freeze. And unfortunately, during World War II, because of political instability, part of this co important collection was lost. Now, um, because of uh, agribusiness, um, clones are not the only crop that is, lacks genetic diversity. Um, corn, I've read that corn in America, 98% of it is genetically identical. And so that it makes it even more important for the seed banks to collect the wild variants. They may have traits that we can't uh, see right away that would help fight drastic global change, uh, climate change, or a new pathogen. For instance, these uh, are a wild corn that has the husk growing around the individual kernels instead of the whole seed head. And um, the colors that you're seeing are talking about the process of drying, but also of drought. And now I'll talk about three, uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures from three key seed banks. Um, it's, it's it's very apparent when you look at these, the way that scientific and political heritage, access to resources, and um, philosophical perspectives make for extremely distinct banks. This is the Millennium Seed Bank in England. And you can notice instead of the little astronaut packets that we store in the United States, they use mason jars. But they have managed to bank 95% of all plants that are bankable in England both wild and cultivated. And now they're trying to save 25% 25, 25 of the world's plant life um, by the year 2020. And this raises an important question about why do some banks save everything and why do others banks just save uh, agricultural crops? In this beautiful greenhouse, also at the Millennium Seed Bank, I saw a nondescript plant in a tiny pot and it had an amazing history. Um, a sea captain during the age of the British colonial empire 200 years ago had collected a set of seeds as natural history specimens and placed them in a leather pouch. Well, the descendants found this leather pouch in their attic of their stately home, of course, and they donated it, the seeds, to the Millennium Seed Bank. And despite the fact that no particular care had been taken of them, the Millennium Seed Bank managed to... Uh, sprout the seeds, and then found that it was an unidentified plant that was thought to be extinct. So in a span of 200 years, against all odds, one sea captain had saved a whole entire species. And this is the Russian National Seed Bank. It, is, uh, it was founded in the 20s by Nikolai Vavilov, a very important geneticist, and it is still located in this building today. 
during World War II. This is the Barley Room, and you can see a portrait of Nikolai Vavilov on the bookshelf. Uh, during World War II, there was a siege of Leningrad, which is what St. Petersburg was called at the time. And the Vavilov at that point had the most, the most important collection in the world. It had the most diversity, which was collected in several field expeditions by Nikolai Vavilov. And there was no backup. And the only reason that this, or one of the reasons that this collection survived was that several of the scientists decided to die of starvation rather than eat the seeds in the collection. And you can't imagine how sad and how profound an experience it is to be in these rooms taking photographs of these places, especially when, you know, in this case, it feels like no time has passed. And each of the seed banks that I photograph at, there is some story that I hear about the efforts of indiv individuals having a huge impact on the future of the collections and close calls and things surviving against the odds. And that, in, in some ways, it's been an interesting experience for me because it's one of the ways now that I choose which seed banks to photograph. This is also a barley collection. It's Russian, and it's a 1,000 miles away from St. Petersburg in Kuban. And um, you can tell that the distance uh, has caused it to not be in quite as good uh, uh, storage conditions as the ones right in downtown St. Petersburg. So how do we monitor the lifelines of seed banks and what that may become of them in the future? And how do we choose which seed banks are important? If we can't ch save everything, then it, the seed banking story, like my photographic story, becomes a story of choice. This is me outside of Svalbard. After two years of working on this project, I was invited to um, go to the opening of the bank. The, most of the time, this bank is closed, and they only open it for about three days a year when they accession more seeds. And this is me uh, wearing every single piece of warm clothing that I owned. <laughs> And this is the tunnel um, going from that front door in deep inside the mountain. Just a few facts. The, um, it's located on a remote island off the coast of Norway, owned by Norway. It is um, only 600 miles from the North Pole. And it is built deep inside the side of a mountain that is high enough that if both the polar ca ice caps melt, it'll still be above the predicted uh, water line. And here at last, you can't imagine, I was filled with anticipation to you know, walk down this tunnel and get to the very door, this frost-covered door that is the door to the ark. All the world, the most biodiverse place in the world is only 600 miles from the North Pole. And I, you know, it was inspired my whole project, and there I was. And it was so ironic to be confronted with a closed-circuit monitor, you know, standing there with a cam my camera, and there's a camera already that beat me there. And it's, <laughs> it's showing the, um, what's just on the other side of that door. It's actually the collection itself is in that picture. And these are boxes waiting to go into the vault. And um, behind the boxes is a curved wall, and it's right on axis with that tunnel that I showed you a minute ago. Um, and the, it is curved because if there is a missile shot down the tunnel, it'll displace the blast and the seeds in the vault will be saved. Um, and on the right-hand side are the U.S. boxes, and on the left-hand side is this little red box, and that is the box from Uganda. And so I saw that and I was heartbroken because I thought, how could this be that in 2010, out of Uganda, one of the most biodiverse places in the world, they only managed to send that box? And then, as I was photographing, because it's, it's dim light, and it took me about 15 minutes to make this exposure, I started thinking about it in another way. I was, you know, it occurred to me that, A, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault exists. And some small group of scientists in Uganda, managed to set, store, collect seeds, store them, find a box, and managed to send it to Svalbard. So these seeds, these species, are now safe. And that we don't know what the future will bring, but some small individual, by, by their individual action, has changed the course of that future. And it's, hope, it's my hope that by 
pursuing this project and bringing the story of seed banks to everyone, that it'll start a conversation. And although it's an incomplete story, and it's my hope that these poetic visual artifacts will start a conversation and perhaps spur one person to action. Thank you.